Hello and welcome to Can Tech Cool the Planet panel discussion brought to you by Codex TV and broadcast on Wednesday, 16th of March. I'm Rakesh Rao, CEO of Codex and your host for today. Before we get going, please remember to click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and the bell icon, and this will ensure you never miss an event on Codex TV. If we are going to have any chance of reaching the Paris Agreement goal of limiting the Earth's temperature to no more than one and a half degrees C of pre-industrial levels, the world will require a green industrial revolution in which virtually every aspect of the real economy is decarbonized. How we manufacture things, how we travel, how we make food, generate electricity, and how we heat and cool buildings. But what if approaches that simply limit CO2 emissions are not enough to cool the planet? So what else can be done? Today, we will examine the potential of some of the most radical technology innovations that could supplement, supplement cutting global emissions. Solar geoengineering, marine algae cultivation, carbon capture and storage. As you can see, in true Codex style, we have a very distinguished panel of speakers, all of whom are at the top of their game in their respective fields. Our panelists are, World-renowned climate scientist, Sir David King, founder and chair of the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge and head of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group. Sir David was also a former Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK government. Dr. Marf fernandez Mendes, marine researcher at the famous Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research. And she's based in Bremerhaven, Germany. And keeping the London end up, Dr. Peter Irvin, climate scientist at UCL Earth Sciences. Detailed speaker bios can be viewed at from the website, which is codex.com. Time is very limited today, so let's get straight into the discussion. So let's start with solar geoengineering. What in simple terms is solar geoengineering? Peter Irvin. Yeah, solar geoengineering describes a set of ideas that aim to directly cool the planet by altering the amount of sunlight that the Earth absorbs. Um, the Earth is warmed primarily by the sun, but it's kept warm by the greenhouse gases, uh, the natural greenhouse effect uh, of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, adding CO2 and other greenhouse gases helps trap more heat, which warms the planet, which is why we need to eliminate CO2 emissions and perhaps also in the long run drive them down through carbon capture technologies. The solar engineering is a complementary way to, of addressing that the Earth's energy budget which um, through various means aims to increase the amount of light that's scattered away from the planet. There's a number of proposals for how to do this. Uh, I'd say the leading proposal is stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, an idea that would aim to increase the amount of light reflected by the planet by adding a layer of reflective particles to the upper atmosphere, to the stratosphere. Um, this would have a cooling effect similar to those that's seen after large volcanic eruptions. Uh, Mount Pinatubo, Mount Krakatoa, Tambora, these great eruptions of the past added millions of tons of sulfur dioxide to the upper atmosphere. Uh, and it just so happens that sulfur dioxide goes on to form very small, very reflective particles, which uh, with volcanoes persist for a couple of years. Um, they scatter light, they cool the surface. Uh, we've seen that um, through observations uh, historically. And this stratospheric aerosol geoengineering is an idea to mimic that cooling effect artificially. Um, we'd get the aerosols, the particles, up to the stratosphere with, with aircraft, most likely. Um, and so far, it seems like this idea may work. Um, so, Sir David, at the, um, at the Centre for uh, Cl uh, Climate Repair, uh, you're advocating a, a technique called marine cloud brightening, which is linked to or related to solar geoengineering. Perhaps you could um, uh, describe more what, of what that involves and what the aim and, and of that would be. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is it's related to, but only in the sense of cooling the planet. The stratospheric process is a very different sort of process from what we're working on. We're working on creating white cloud cover over specific areas of the planet where cooling is, uh, is desperately needed. So let me take you to the Arctic Circle region where Arctic ice covering the Arctic Ocean has been lost during the solar summer months up there. So during those solar three months when the sun is shining in the middle of the summer, 24 hours a day, ice has now been lost. 50% uh, of the ocean is exposed to sunlight. 
and the atmosphere above the ocean is therefore warming up very rapidly. The effect of this is to warm up Greenland, Greenland ice, and I'm quoting the IPCC, is now melting irreversibly. That will lead ultimately to a sea level rise of about six and a half meters, 23, 24 feet. And that, of course, creates a very different shape to the land masses of the planet. The second thing is the amount of methane captured in permafrost on the surrounding land mass, uh, uh, the permafrost regions. And again, rapid evolution of methane could cause rapid heating. So what we want to do is see if we can specifically cool the Arctic Ocean by creating white cloud cover that would reflect sunlight away from the, the Arctic Sea where ice has been formed over the previous uh, winter period, the polar winter period, ice forms right across the Arctic Sea. So if we can keep that layer of Arctic Sea every year, we can keep it growing uh, during every Arctic winter period. Now, th this is a question of using a process that mimics nature, nature mimicry, in the sense that when, when waves break on the ocean surface, they create tiny droplets of water. The tiniest droplets are carried up by atmospheric currents, taking them up. And this can create white clouds, or it creates tiny crystals of salt in the atmosphere, which when they drop onto a black cloud, turn it into a white cloud. Now that's the basis of what we're doing. I would say that the project that uh, has, has been described to you by Peter is, is properly described as geoengineering, I see this as more biomimicry. And uh, Mark, you've um, worked in the Arctic, you spent some quite considerable time in the Arctic. Uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, the te technique of reed cloud brightening? What, what are your views on this specific solution? Yeah, so I, I've been several times in the Arctic Ocean and I, I know firsthand all the results and I've seen it with my own eyes how sea ice is uh, declining every year. Uh, we even reached the minimum again this last summer and so the consequences for that ecosystem and for the global ecosystems are, are dramatic and unfortunately because we're not getting our act together in reducing emissions and absorbing carbon from the atmosphere fast enough, uh, we are getting to the point where things like solar radiation management or cloud brightening might be our only solution for these local um, effects to uh, avoid catastrophic uh, consequences. So it would have been better if we would have started years ago reducing emissions and uh, absorbing CO2 because that is the cause of the problem. Temperature is just the, the symptom. But by now, yeah, we're basically reaching, reaching an end. So we have to try um, everything we can. Um why us? I mean, the technique um, seems uh, um, simple in, in itself um, in terms of how you'd go about doing it. Um, why are scientists so cautious about solar geoengineering, uh, Peter? Well, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's some good reasons to be cautious about it. Um, first, there's the reason this could be a distraction. There's a important work to get done in terms of cutting emissions, and we really shouldn't be distracted from that work. And I think while it's a fear that we will be distracted, I think it's important to stress that all of us, all of those researchers working on these ideas uh, don't see it as a replacement for emissions cuts. Um, I think everyone is, a, is, is very keen to stress that this is at best a complement to these ideas, a complement to emissions cuts. And there's also the fact that at this stage, we're not confident fully of its consequences or its results. Um, you know, we've been researching these ideas, um, particularly marine cloud brightening and stratospheric aerosol engineering, only for the last 10, 15 years in any, in any degree, uh, to any degree. And really, the amount of effort that's been put into these um, it pales in comparison to the amount of analysis and work that's been done on climate change. So we're really at an early stage in understanding these ideas. They might not pan out, but I think given the threat that climate change poses, it would be foolish to ignore the potential of uh, both marine cloud brightening and stress for aerosol engineering as, as ways to potentially reduce the risk of climate change. And, and David, um, you've worked with um, many, many governments um, over the years. Would a technique like this not require international cooperation uh, to, to, to encourage more research and perhaps to do some 
uh, field trials? Yes, absolutely. So let, let me just pick up on the discussion that is already beginning to emerge. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that uh, I do agree uh, with what Ma has said. The, the, the loss of ice over the Arctic Ocean is the first of the great tipping points, and there are 15 tipping points that climate scientists have evaluated around the world. And, it, and this is a set of dominoes. So as the ice is lost over the Arctic Ocean, so ice is lost over the Greenland. Ice rapidly entering the ocean could well turn off the overturning current. So that's the next potential tipping point. And frankly, at that point, I think all bets are off. In other words, the future of humanity is no longer going to be a manageable future. So I, I, I just want to slightly disagree with what Peter has said. I'm going to say deep and rapid emissions reduction, yes, is required. And I, yeah, we all are very committed to that. But at the same time, we are already at a dangerous point where we need to rapidly cool the Arctic region. Uh, we have a, a explosive release of methane now occurring in northern Siberia. Some, some over 1,000 of these explosions have occurred. Methane is a very strong greenhouse gas. It's true, it has only a short half-life, but nevertheless, the results of what is currently happening in the uh, Arctic Circle region are going to impact on the entire planet over the coming future. So I want to say it's necessary for us to see how we can rapidly maintain the ice coverage over the Arctic Sea that's formed during the polar winter. I don't think we have an option. If we don't do this, we really run the risk of losing that overturning current, which is the great energy conveyor belt of the, of the ocean system. It manages to keep the northern hemisphere warmer than it would otherwise be, but also manages to keep the, the uh, central region around the world uh, cooler as a result of taking hot water away from the equatorial region. So I, th I think the first and most important thing to say is we need all of the above, deep and rapid emissions reduction, but we also must, as a priority, learn how to cool the, the uh, uh, North Pole region. And I, I would say that here at Cambridge, we're now working with a consortium around the world to manage this problem and we want to accelerate that. The only slow point is the rate at which we can raise money to do this. Yes, to answer your question, we would want to get global agreement on how we manage this problem so that there isn't a great uh, hoo-ha as, as this progresses. Of course, we must do that. And that process has to begin as soon as we have some confidence that we can proceed. But David, I mean, it took decades to reach the Paris Agreement. Um, we haven't got decades, really, have we? So having worked with many, many governments, how could you sort of expedite this process, given the sense of urgency, and really get some proper research and field trials into this solar geoengineering technique? Uh, my goodness, Rakesh, this is the, <laughs> this is the biggest question. So I, I was in <laughs> the negotiations for Britain in, in my last job in the Cameron and May government. And let me say, the average number of uh, official negotiators per country is 20, so that means there are nearly 4,000 negotiators congregating in one country. <laughs> Can you imagine how ghastly that is, how slow it is? It's like trying to walk through molasses that has got, hardly got any movement in it whatsoever. The process leading up to Paris, I decided that we had to take a different position. We began to negotiate bilaterally. So Britain, I, I made 96 official country visits negotiating country by country. We had 165 climate attaches in our embassies around the world built up when I was with Blair. And in the negotiations, Cameron provided a budget, which is unbelievable, nine billion pounds was provided to us to accelerate the negotiating process. By the time we arrived in Paris, actually I knew it was a done deal. 
So all of the two weeks of negotiations were people making speeches. Somebody's described that uh, Greta as blah, blah, blah. And that really is how it goes. Now, we have a crisis on our hands, and I do not think that this is a mechanism. I don't want to suggest that the COP process should be abandoned. It is a critically important process, but we need a rapid action process. We need today an emergency plan, which means that I would like to see a smaller group of people able to be exercising this management process of this crisis. Let me just take you to the first, the deep and rapid emissions reduction. That means we're moving away from fossil fuels. That's yesterday's technology. We're moving away from removal of forests. We have to move away from these very quickly, but at the same time, see that there's no suffering as a result of this. And all of this needs careful management with the leading countries, the wealthy countries leading the way and actually helping with much bigger sums of money than are currently going to the developing world. So you know, you're, you're raising such an important issue. The negotiations are painfully slow. And that's why we're in this fix now. We have a climate crisis. We can no longer say, let's just do this so we can save the, the planet for the next century. Sorry. No, no. If we don't act now, we are really cooked going into the future. But in practical terms, what would this mean? Would this mean um, some Western democracies and democracies in other parts of the world coming together in a smaller group? Uh, to negotiate um, and perhaps uh, do some research in, into these areas? Well, I'm just going to say, why democracies? What, who are you eliminating in that process? I certainly would want China on board. China, unbelievably, because I say that because they are in, everyone is criticizing China. They are leading the way on the international scene. They have done much more in terms of developing solar panels, developing offshore wind, onshore wind. All of this process is being led by China. They have more renewables actually up and running than other countries, any other country. The United States is the slow one. And that might be because they are a very split democracy. So no, I, I think we do need a group of people who would include, and I say this really meaningfully, this would include indigenous people from the, the uh, forested regions of the tropical forests. I think also from the Inuit people and the Sami people living on the permafrost. We need a representative of those people. A represent so we need a properly representative group of people who are given the task by the United Nations to take us out of this mess. I just wanted to also touch on the, the Harvard um, SCOPEX uh, field trial. I mean, this was supposed to happen in, in 2021. I think there was opposition against it and, and it was delayed. Is there any chance of that trial happening um, this year, uh, later this year? I mean, uh, Peter, I know you've written a, a paper or article with uh, David Keith, the uh, founder of uh, carbon engineering. Uh, he was has also been a previous speaker at Codex in 2019. Do you think there's any um, uh, hope that that trial could actually go ahead uh, later this year? Well, I actually I actually worked at Harvard for for a few years in David Keith's group. Um, I, I wasn't involved in Scopex, um, and I'm not 100 percent sure of their plans. I think they hope to run that experiment again, but I think there are some there are some challenges. I mean, I, I think they face this um, yeah this opposition to this Swedish test. Um, but I think, uh, in, as far as I understand it, the opposition was not on the basis of the physical harms that could result from this field test, but more about the, the implications of this idea. And, and my, my feeling, I guess, is that, um, you know, if the, if the experiment itself can be carried out without causing harms, then it's more or less an ordinary experiment. If you are to try and restrict research on the basis of the, the kind of um, uh, the, the image, the effect that it would have on the discussion of this idea, then I think it's, it's not a sensible basis for which to prohibit research. Because um, the same thing, you'd have an impact on the discussion on people's understanding of the world through commentary, through writing. 
So um, yeah, I think, there's, I think there's a good prospect that experiment will happen, but I'm not sure exactly if there are plans. No. And, and David, um, where does the UK currently stand on uh, solar geoengineering? My, my understanding is that, that there was um, um, some research and some funds available for this technique up until 2014, uh, but then all of a sudden we stopped. Uh, why was that? These experiments have been terminated, and I have to say, first of all, why stop experiments? By all means, examine carefully the rollout at scale. But stopping experiments is simply absurd. It's simply absurd. There's, there's no absolute reason at all. One of my colleagues here in Cambridge had planned a great experiment to, to pipe up into the stratosphere uh, liquid material that CAD could be operated as a, an aerosol spray into the stratosphere. This sounds like a piece of amazing engineering, and it was. And all he was planning to do in the experiment was to pipe up water. And that was banned. That was it. So we, 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 we no longer have the capability of doing experiments into the stratospheric geoengineering. We might have to do it. And that, that just seems to me absurd not to do the experiments so that if we have to do it, it will be safe. Sure. Let's, um, Ma, let's move on to your work uh, with developing an offshore seaweed aquifarm uh, with, their sea, with their sea fields. Um, perhaps you could uh, start by explaining why seaweed is so important to the Earth's ecosystem and um, why this uh, seaweed sargassum is so uh, useful in capturing carbon. Yeah, so let me start by saying that uh, before before I get into the open ocean aquafarms, that for any of these approaches, the social licensing is key. So only once people understand um, that the climate crisis is going to put us in a way worse place than trying out and doing experiments on all these um, processes, once they understand that and they stand behind the science, then things will start moving. But people are by nature afraid and they still consider the atmosphere and the ocean as pristine environments that they don't want to mess up with. What they don't realize is that we have already messed them up. So we now need to fix that. And only when people understand the scales of the problem and the speed at which we need to act, then they will start supporting this type of research. And with iron fertilization in the ocean, it was the same 10 years ago. All, everything was banned because some people thought, oh, this might cause uh, problems. And there was actually no proof that it was going to be harmful. So we do have to be, as a scientific community, very careful. So yes, we need to test everything and test the environmental impacts. But at the same time, we need to be honest and push things forward because we need to do the research on this. And so after saying that, <laughs> I will uh, move on to why moving to the open ocean um, as an option for carbon sequestration. So I'm gonna talk about carbon sequestration and not solar radiation management. And so if you think about plants and, and algae, they're basically the most efficient natural machine that we have to sequester CO2. And so of course on land, we've all heard about uh, planting trees. This is one of the favorite ways to sequester carbon. However, um, a forest can burn any minute and with climate change, this is becoming even more often. I mean, we've all heard the great fires in Australia and in California in the last years. And second of all, trees need uh, space on land. They need water and they need nutrients. And so we cannot cover them. Even if we would cover the entire uh, land with trees, it wouldn't be enough to sequester all the carbon we need to sequester. So we need to start moving into the ocean. And so a lot of people have been working on coastal ecosystems, the famous blue carbon, so mangroves, seagrasses, et cetera. They are great and they have other co-benefits. However, they are restricted to certain areas in the coast. And so even if you would use up all the space that you can to grow these coastal ecosystems, you will also not get there in terms of the magnitude of gigatons of carbon that we need to remove from the atmosphere. And so the only logical step is to move to the open ocean. Our planet is 50% covered by oceans, if it's not more. And you know the subtropical gyres are 50% of the ocean. And right now in the subtropical gyres, there is almost nothing happening. It's like the ocean deserts. And so if we manage to fertilize those parts of the ocean 
with artificial upwelling, and this is where the technology part comes in, then it would be like irrigating formerly unproductive uh, land. So it's kind of, it's the next revolution, right? We want to create ocean gardens in the middle of the ocean. Then when I started my research um, at Geomar and Wolf Liebes' group on artificial upwelling, we quickly realized that phytoplankton is maybe not gonna be the game changer. So it can contribute to enhance ocean productivity and it can be good for enhancing fisheries. And it of course depends on how you do the upwelling, but we were thinking, okay, we need um, an algae with a much higher carbon to nutrient ratio. So something that is really efficient at, at taking up carbon. And that's why we came up with the idea of, of using macroalgae for this. And so people tend to think about macroalgae and they think about kelp, right? That's the first one that comes to people's mind when they hear seaweed or macroalgae. And this is also a great algae, but it requires a substrate to grow and it's very useful for other purposes. So when you think about carbon sequestration, you rather want an algae that is free floating, that has a very high carbon to nutrient ratio. So it's very efficient at taking up carbon, that it can grow almost everywhere, basically, and that no animals like to eat it because if not, you know, it would be gone. And so that's why we came up with Sargassum. Sargassum is uh, right now, it's a, it's a floating macroalgae, Sargassum fluitans and Sargassum natans that escaped the Sargasso Sea due to climate change. So there was a change in the North Atlantic Oscillation in 2011. And that's how Sargasso escaped the Sargasso Sea. And now every year it's forming this Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt that is basically across the entire uh, tropical Atlantic. So from West Africa to the Caribbean. It's causing a huge problem in the Caribbean because it all ends there, there and it lands on the beaches and then it degrades there, releasing the CO2 back to the atmosphere, most of it. And so the idea would be to take the pressure off the coastlines and bring this productivity and this seaweed to the open ocean and there try to create this open ocean aqua farms where we would also co-harvest uh, other species that might be good for um, feeding uh, the world like shrimps or other mussels, other things. And so the idea is to have these huge aqua farms where you can harvest the sargassum, then extract um, valuable products out of it, especially the nutrients because you don't want to sink them back and then only sink the carbon into the deep ocean. Now there's a lot of people again that scream about, oh my God, you cannot put uh, seaweed in the deep ocean. Well, seaweed is already in the deep ocean, of course, the magnitude would be different. And the idea would be to bail it so that it doesn't get remineralized and it doesn't get consumed, or at least not at a quick um, rate. We're still doing experiments on this. There's still a lot to learn about this. Um, but the idea is that we would have this deep ocean depots where we store these bales of sargassum. And you kind of, you could even use them in the future, you know, if future generations require energy again, they can go and dig them out. It's like reversing the pumping out of the, of the oil. And so once we know that the environmental impacts in the deep sea are, you know, within the constraints and we always have to compare them with the cost of doing nothing. And if we do nothing, as, um, as David mentioned before, the deep ocean will be anoxic within a hundred years because of the stop of the conveyor belt. So when we talk about environmental impacts, we need to think about what would happen if we do nothing. And so that would be a safe permanent storage of the carbon in the deep sea, because also depending on where you put those bales of sargassum, it would take between 700 and a thousand years for those waters that are around those uh, bales to come back to the atmosphere. So even if everything would be remineralized, which will not be the case, then even then you still have like a thousand years. And I mean, I don't know if you've heard that the Endeavour was discovered recently in Antarctica, the ship from Shackleton. And you could see, you know, after a hundred years, the wood was intact. And so you need to imagine these bales of sargassum kind of like, like wood, because if you remove all the nutrients, then the bugs down there will not eat it because it's not tasty, it would be more like wood. And so that's the aim to basically create a product that can stay there um, for a long, long period of time. And where would these aqua farms be located in which oceans and, and whereabouts exactly? 
So we are the, for the initial test, we're looking at the subtropical um, Atlantic. So basically, there's an island called St. Helena that is kind of in between uh, South Africa and uh, Brazil. And famous for its tortoises as well. <laughs> and then somewhere basically north of that without being in any uh, marine protected area. That's where we want to do the initial tests. Yeah. And what about the costs? I mean, um, on, on the current calcul calculation, obviously this would have to be a scaled up process, but doing the maths, I mean, how much would it cost to sequester one ton of carbon using your technique, using your technology? So we're still, of course, uh, doing those calculations because uh, it all depends on how we construct the upwelling pipes. So that's the, the limiting factor in terms of technology and of costs. And um, the good thing is that we're using a method uh, that does not require input of energy. So we're not using wave pumps or uh, you know, turbines or solar or anything. We're using the density gradient of the ocean to bring the, the waters up. So we have a double pipe that uses the warm water is downwelling and the cold water is upwelling. I mean, Stommel described this uh, many decades ago and it has already been tested. So the principle works and now we're in the design phase to design a pipe that is efficient enough to bring enough nutrients to the surface to grow the sargassum. And so the costs, uh, I mean, we've done, of course, uh, an analysis and it can range from, you know, $100 per ton to, you know, 300, 600, depending on what the final costs of, of those pipes. So we're now in the optimization process to see how we can do this in a cost-effective way. But thinking only of the fact that, you know, the pipes don't re require input of energy. The sargassum grows like crazy if you give it enough nutrients and it doesn't require also any energy. You know, it, it, it can only be a win-win situation. I mean, it's it's a really low energy, low input uh, system once it's once it's running. And are there any drawbacks to this method? Anything that would concern you? Anything that you'd have to monitor? Or so we have to monitor a lot of things, <laughs> definitely. Starting with you know how much carbon is actually sequestered. What is the air, ocean flux to see that the water gets replenished and so on. And then we need to look at the environmental impact. I mean, these are areas that are otherwise deserts. And so what happens if you create an oasis in the desert? Is that a positive impact? Would we enhance biodiversity and create like fisheries around it or will it have some negative impact? So this is something that we definitely need to monitor. And that's why it's great to have like the international scientific community behind this type of projects because then you're, you're sure that we will look at all the angles and everything to, to make sure that you know, it's not causing more damage than it's uh, solving. And I guess you could also extract some useful products from the sargassum as well. Correct. So the, the benefit is that because sargassum has been arriving in the Caribbean for the last 10 years, there's a lot of small companies specialized now in creating products out of the sargassum. So we know very well how to extract the high value products and then commercialize them. So that is, that is really um, well understood by now. So this would be biofuels, bioplastics, biofertilizers, that kind of thing. Correct, exactly. And those would contribute to, you know, prevent more emissions from fossil fuels. So it will come into the part of avoided emissions. So one thing is the additional carbon sequestration that we will manage with the, with the bales. But then, of course, all the products that can be created from sargassum would be substituting fossil fuel um, products, like, as you said, biofuels, fertilizers, etc. So David, uh, at, the, at your Centre for Climate Repair, you advocate marine biomass regeneration. Perhaps you could explain more of what that is. My starting point is very well described by what Mars has been saying. Most of our deep oceans are close to being deserts. In other words, the amount of living matter in the deep, beautiful blue oceans is very, very little. But let me take you back 300, 400 years ago before we started whaling. Uh, we discovered that uh, the large whales, the so-called baleen whales, have a vast amount of blubber. And so it paid off to send ships literally around the world to catch whales. 
And in that process, we removed a very high proportion of the world's whales, especially the baleen whales, because they're the whales with a vast amount of blubber to protect themselves against the cold sea. And they tend to go 300, 400 meters down, even d deeper than that, and they need the blubber to keep them warm. Okay, so what we understand now is that the baleen whales performed a critically important function as a biological pump in the oceans. Uh, what Mar has explained is that they're talking about upwelling nutrients from the floor of the ocean up to the surface region, putting them into the sunlit region at the top, where, of course, sunlight proceeds with photosynthesis. What we're looking at is the function of the whales in the entire ocean biosystem. So the whales eat krill, perhaps 300 meters, 400 meters down in the ocean. They spend a long time down there. They've got enormous lungs. They, they take a vast amount of air with them. And the, the function of the whales was previously thought to be just moving to the surface to, to get oxygen. And that movement creating an upward current to cause the upwelling that Mars talking about creating. But we now, of course, note that the whales cannot excrete when they're down 300, 400 meters down because of the pressure on their orifice. And so they come up to the surface, not only for air, but also to excrete. And if you get a pod of whales coming up to the surface region, and maybe you know the pod creates a layer of uh, whale poo, if I can call it that in your program, which uh, it may cover a thousand square kilometers or even 5,000 square kilometers of area with this excreted material, which is, of course, nutrient. It's missing nutrient from the surface of the ocean. And as a result, very quickly, it's phytoplankton that grows quite without any stimulation. Phytoplankton grows in that area. Phytoplankton grows very quickly in less than a week. But within a month, that area may have, I, I don't want to exaggerate, 100 million fish. It could be half a, half a billion fish in that area. Now, we understand that process, but we haven't until now recently understood. You kill the whales and you take out the biological pump. And so you also take out the, the fish and the crustaceans. So the krill, where do the whales go to for krill? The Arctic and the Antarctic. There's still significant amount of krill there. But where do they go to have their babies? The female whales go up towards the equatorial region where before they could live all their lives, but there's no krill for them to eat there. So the females feed their babies until they also have developed enough fat to protect them before they go back into the, the Southern Ocean, for example. Now, the, the result of this is that the, the whale uh, um, reproduction rate is actually kept very low. The mothers lose a vast percentage of their blubber in this process. They, they go back to the Southern Ocean to feed again. So what I'm saying is we can put artificial whale excretia on the surface of the ocean. We're learning how to keep it in the surface region by floating it, interestingly, with waste material from rice production, the rice husks float. And so we're running an experiment in the Arabian Sea from Goa next month to use these rice husks as a means of seeing if we can put the nutrient material on them and then disperse the nutrient into what we call the photic zone, the, the region which is in sunlight at the surface of the ocean. I believe that it's perfectly feasible, if we can operate this at scale, that we could return the oceans to the biological state they were in hundreds of years ago, where these oceans were full of fish, they were full of crustaceans, they were full of whales, and we got rid of 99% of most of those in this process, not understanding that by removing the whales, we were also removing the ability of the oceans to deliver other living matter. So this is a, a major project. 
which is aimed at improving the ocean biodiversity, but in that process, also capturing really vast amounts of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, taking it down into well sequestered areas at the bottom of the ocean. So there's a, there's a whole story there about capturing really very significant amounts of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And our object is to see if we can bring the atmospheric greenhouse gas content down from the current 500 parts per million, if we count methane as we should, uh, to something like 350 parts per million, which is what I believe is required to create a manageable future for humanity. 350 parts per million, those tipping points would no longer be tipping. We only have a, a few minutes left. Um, we've discussed um, a lot about uh, natural ways to um, capture and sequester carbon. What about some of the more industrial ways of carbon removal, like uh, direct air capture? I'm thinking in particular of the, um, the Orca project in Iceland, uh, companies like Carbon Engineering, Global Thermosat, et cetera. Uh, what are your thoughts on these more mechanical ways of carbon capture, uh, Peter? Um, I think we need an all, all the above approach. I mean, I think the advantage, I mean, I think maybe there's sort of, I guess sort of three categories of uh, carbon capturing ideas. Um, those that rely on uh, biology in some sense, um, where you are perturbing the natural ecosystem, perhaps in a way that's disruptive, perhaps in a way that's beneficial, uh, like the methods we were just hearing about. There's um, agricultural approaches. So there's the bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage ideas. So here you grow some energy crop, you then run it through a power plant, but rather than emitting the CO2 to the atmosphere as normal, you capture that with these carbon capture and storage technologies. You chemically extract the CO2 from the, from the, from the gas, and then you um, separate it, pump it underground. Um, the disadvantage there, of course, is you need a lot of land to pursue that kind of approach. And then there's this third sort of technological category, so here, rather than relying on photosynthesis to capture your CO2 from the atmosphere, you directly pull it from the atmosphere um, using chemical processes and then recycle those chemicals, which requires a lot of energy. So the, the disadvantage there is that it might be a high upfront industrial cost to set up the facility and then a high energy cost to run it. Now, the yeah, these, these technological means, there might be ways that, you know, as the experience develops, as the technology improves, the costs could come down and down. Uh, and potentially this offers a way to deal with the, the excess, the surplus energy that we'll generate with renewables. I, I'm not sure exactly on the on the economics of that, but you know, in the middle of the day, we gen we're gonna generate a lot of solar power and we're going to find uses for it. So yeah, I, I think um, these artificial carbon capture and storage ideas are, are, are promising. Uh, they're at an early stage, um, but yeah, there's real potential there. Ma, your thoughts on direct air capture? So my thoughts are that, uh, well, as Peter said, they just consume a lot of energy. And so they are viable in places like Iceland where you have geothermal energy. But if we need to think that the energy demands of a growing population will increase and we're already lagging behind on our renewable energy uh, sources, it will be very difficult to scale direct air carbon capture up to the magnitudes that are needed. I mean, just as an example, the, the Orca um, um, plant in Iceland, I think it sequesters basically in one year what we emit in four seconds. So just for magnitudes. And so basically, as I said, yes, we need all of the above so that complementarily we manage to get to the amounts of carbon that we need to sequester to reach safe CO2 levels in the atmosphere, but I don't think that this um, direct air carbon capture will be able to scale up with the current energy demands global wide. And final words, Sir David, on direct air capture. Right, so direct air capture, I, I'm, I'm not uh, very, very keen on many of the processes that are being talked about. The, the Iceland process, yes, geothermal energy, but very few people are aware of the fact that the average carbon footprint per person in Iceland is one of the highest in the entire northern hemisphere. Right? Why? Because they're still burning coal for electricity. So while they, they are saying they're using geothermal energy for this, they're taking it off the grid 
that geothermal energy could go on the grid. There's always a bit of a cheating process that goes on. If I say that I'm only using renewable energy and I do try to do that, I also know I'm picking up energy from the grid. So I, I think we have to be very, very careful in how we evaluate these. But the, the Iceland process is looking at a viable process and it is possible to expand that process and deliver it around the world in many, many places. The, the, the Iceland experiment could be repeated. But what I'm not very keen on is the direct air capture process, which you see with great big turbines blowing air through a, uh, a machine that captures carbon dioxide. And the reason that these big turbines are there is to create a draft of air equivalent to about 50 cubic meters per second. And you, you need that sort of volume of air going through the system to deliver enough carbon dioxide to justify capturing it. So these vast fans blowing air, and there might be a hundred of them, to deliver enough air to, to capture a reasonable amount. And the cost at the moment is five, six hundred dollars a ton with no compensation from any commercial product in the process. Now, there, there are plants like this in Canada and in California. And frankly, I think they, there, there, is, there is no future for the, those because of the enormous energy consumption involved. However, I, I really hesitate to criticize any of these we need experiments done to evaluate all of these technologies. We are in a desperate situation, right? So let's remember the climate crisis needs a focused effort to deliver the best technologies involved. And that means trying many, many different capabilities and technologies so that we can emerge with the best. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So in closing, I would like to thank our panelists. Sir David King, founder and chair of the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge, head of the Climate Advisory, head of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group. Dr. Mar Fernandez Mendes, marine researcher at the Alfred Wegener Institute. And Dr. Peter Irvin, climate scientist at UCL Earth Sciences. <laughs> And that's it for today. If you've enjoyed this event, please don't forget to subscribe to the Codex YouTube channel. Click on the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and the bell icon, and this will ensure you never miss an event on Codex TV. Thanks for watching, and do join us again for our next event, which will look at quantum computing on Wednesday, the 27th of April. Until then, please enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>